putting you front and center. <laughs> but just, you know, we have a very diverse audience here. Um, people who are very familiar with India, like Shiv, and people who may have never visited India in their life. So Carla, I wanted to start, when we talk about, you know, the, the way we titled this talk was, you know, social change in India, dismantling the patriarchy. <laughs> but when we talk about patriarchy in India, what does that mean exactly? And how does the patriarchy in India differ from, say, the patriarchy elsewhere? Yeah. Um, so, by the way, when I told my husband I was coming to talk about dismantling the patriarchy in India, he said, uh, I hope they've got like 78 hours because that's pretty much all you talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think, look, patriarchy manifests itself around the world in many, you know, many similar ways, right? Legal structures, um, infrastructure that holds people in power in place and ensures that people who don't have power um, don't have a voice and don't have methods to change things. Um, what I think is singular and unique about uh, the Indian context is that um, patriarchy has really been upheld by these multiple layers of taboo, right? And these all sort of operate together, whether it's about um, women's menstrual health, uh, which has traditionally been used to sort of limit women's access to spaces, um, or whether it has to do with a uh, complete lack of sex education and open and frank conversations about reproductive health. Um, this is something we hear about all the time, actually, um, where sometimes in schools, they'll just tear out the chapter that relates to the human reproductive system because the teachers are uncomfortable teaching it and the parents don't want teachers teaching it. And so there's this, just this overall, you know, the taboo's coming from all sides. And as a result, what you have is um, students who never get basic education on human sexuality and the human reproductive system. Um, and uh, you can see how that can become a problem, of course, you know, later. Um, so, so, so the patriarchy definitely manifests itself in this, this sort of lack of transparency around a lot of things. Um, mental health, certainly. Uh, we've got in India one mental health professional per 16,000 people. Uh, not easy to access basic information about mental health. Um, and, and so what all of that leads to is obviously a lot of confusion, but, um, but what it also leads to is shame and stigma against people who don't fit within these very traditional gender stereotypes, right? And um, so non-traditional family structures, uh, women who don't sort of subscribe to the, the traditional gender stereotypes, uh, stereotyped roles as, as wife and mother, um, and so people who sort of buck convention, um, there is a lot of shame and stigma associated with that. What I will say is that things are changing very, very quickly. And what feels exciting about India right now is the momentum, the pace of change. Um, and so why yeah. has that happened? So, you know, in the, yeah. I don't, for anyone who's been following along, yeah. in, in the last 18, 24 months, there's just been this explosion of change. Like, was there a certain trigger point that, you know, or something that really started some of this change? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so, actually. I mean, feminism has been alive and well in India for a long time, right? But what has changed, as you pointed out in your introduction, is that um, people are, wh where they are pushing back against the status quo and where they are bucking against these taboos and where they are questioning them, they now have more of a platform, right, with social media, with the ability to go online and find basic healthcare information, um, just with the ability to connect with other people who have some of the same perspectives and are questioning the status quo. Um, that, in and of itself, I think is allowing us to sort of amplify these voices. I think that's been the main difference. Mm -hmm. Sonam, let's, let's turn to you for a minute. I mean, I think like 15.6 million on Instagram. So and you, um, I talk about lipstick all the time. Yeah, but you talk <laughs> about other things too, right? Yeah. Right now you're doing like a book club and you talk about you know, LGBT rights. And for you, social media has become really a platform, not just to you know, talk about lipstick, but to talk about really Everything. important issues. Can you talk about, you know, as, as someone who has this voice and platform, you know, how has it changed the way you think about these issues in India that Carla's been talking about? And, you know, and wh what have you learned from that? So, I mean, social media has a bad name, but like um, it was said before, it's a tool. Like you said before, it's a tool. So you can either build a house with it or break someone's head with it. It's a hammer, you know. So you have to use it effectively and you have to use it 
the right way. Um, I think it's an amazing platform. I mean, I'm grateful that I'm famous. I'm born to a famous dad, to a famous granddad, and it just, uh, my mom said, I think she read something, um, and she sent that to me. She said, um, if, you, if you've got a big table instead of building walls, why don't you just build a larger table so people can sit with it and sit with you and eat with you and enjoy you know, all the stuff that you've been given in life? And, um, and that really resonated with me. So when I was very young, I, I, I started acting when I was like 20, 19, 20 years old. And at 21, I remember doing my first interview, and they said, what is the one thing that your dad has taught you that has um, you know, stood with you? And I was like, my dad says he's a feminist, and I learned that from him, and I'm a feminist. And I had my PR team look at me and say, you can't say that, that makes you unfeminine. And I was like, what? And then I went to my dad, and I said that, and he's like, don't listen to them, they don't know what they're talking about. I said, you hired them for me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's like, no, you have to say that, and that's the kind of teaching I got and I realized how protected I was in the film industry because when I joined the film industry, I entered the real world and there was rampant sexism, there was homophobia, um, and there was, I, I can't even explain to you, it was not a nice place to be. And I was like, if I'm going to be successful, which I was, thankfully, thank God, and um, I was like, I have to use my voice, uh, not just to be funny and to be pretty, but to say something that makes a difference in people's lives, and so I did it. It's easy. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, by the way, um, Sonam's father is like a living legend in India. Uh, if you watch Slumdog Millionaire, yeah. he's the... He's um, the evil guy. <laughs> he's, he's like a, you know, a, I don't know, like I, I can't even think of a kind of Western counter, like an analog, but suffice to say he's a living legend. So when, when you grow up in a family mm -hmm. like that, it does come with a certain privilege, yes, right? Yes, it does. And when you're privileged... Um, I think it's more important to use that instead of, you know, a lot of, I mean, I never wanted to be that kid who's like, oh my God, I'm so rich, I'm so famous, and I want these photographs taking, you know, these photographers taking my pictures and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I, I don't want to feel sorry for myself. Like, I don't want to be the poor little rich girl. I was like, I can dress up. I can, you know, stand for things that I really believe in. I want to act and maybe make films that make a difference and uh, do those kind of films instead of just running around trees. And I think... Um, <laughs> running around trees. Yeah. <laughs> That's what people think, right? Yeah. Um, no, but it was... It, it was it's, 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 been, it's, it's been very telling um, that, that things have happened. But I think... The change has been happening for the past 10, 15 years, actually. Yeah. I keep telling my dad, you ruined it, because I was like, you came into the industry in the 60s and the 70s with the golden years of the film industry, where there was Saraswati Chandra and Bandhani and Sujata, these amazing feminist films that were being made. And in the 80s, my dad became this movie star, and he was this like very like toxic male like <laughs> idea of, like, I'm a me man, you woman, I protect. You know, yeah, I was right. just like, ugh. You know, and I was just like, you ruined it, Dad. Yeah. And how can you teach me this stuff? But so, what's interesting now is like yeah. the films coming out of Bollywood. Yeah. And um, there's more and more of them that are bucking to the us. stereotype. That there's no more dancing around trees. And I think there's more films that are addressing these kinds of issues yeah. head on. Yeah. I think it's, um, well, you know, a lot of the people don't know what's working in the film industry, because a film like Nija, which I did, uh, which shockingly like, um, uh, was produced, and we, we, had a we had a hard time getting finance for it. And um, it became the most profitable fi female film ever made. And it's a film about a it's, a, it's a real story, it's an autobiography of a girl who's in one outfit, which people like to see in multiple outfits, but I was in one outfit through the whole thing, and you know how it ends, and she was just in a plane, and she was saving these lives, and it did so well. So people want real stories, they want to connect, they want to feel, and that's the amazing thing about India. India has incredible EQ, incredible empathy, and that's why they want change, they, they need change, and we don't, we don't have to take you know, I always tell, I, I only know film, so I keep telling people I can only relate in film, and I keep telling producers and directors, let's not take the audience for granted. They're smarter than we think they are. 
We don't have to dumb down anything for them. If you give them something fine, they'll recognize something fine and smart. And that's why um, we have, you know, um, uh, Section 377 that was abolished. You know, homosexuality is now absolutely legal in India. And I think, I mean, obviously, I, I just... And it's, it's something that has, it, you know, in our Hindu shastras, which we like to call in our, in our books, you know, LG, uh, you know, LGBTQ people were never looked down upon. They were celebrated. They were prayed to. And, um, you know, and over the last, you know, 70 years, instead of progressing, we did regress, you know, with the colonization. We regressed instead of progressing. And a lot of the things that made our culture so amazing were kind of, um, were, took a back seat, and I think that's all coming back. You know, the spirituality, the acceptance, um, I don't know, religious, it's, it's a melting pot. India is a melting pot. pot. It's, um, but there's still problems to address, right? Yeah. So Carla, I mean, Carla's website, and if, if any of you have the chance today, go look at it, <laughs> theswaddle.com. It's amazing. It's an amazing yeah. website because it's telling stories in India that were never really told. I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the day-to-day -day challenges that women in India still face around, you know, violence and, you know, sexual health, reproductive health, and, and how far are we from actually trying to, starting to see solutions to some of these challenges? Yeah, so I'll tell you, I mean, I think the, the example of healthcare is a really interesting one, because in India, um, healthcare information is not necessarily easy to come by, so it is traditionally crowdsourced from your community, right? Meaning your immediate family, the people you live with. And in many instances, um, this is changing now dramatically, but traditionally, um, young women would get married and then move into their husband's family home, right? So there are these joint family structures where there are the matriarch and patriarch, and then the adult children with their uh, why the adult sons, I suppose, with their wives, right, and grandchildren, all living under one roof. It's amazing. And so, yeah, and so, so, but when you talk about when you talk about access to women's health information, as I already mentioned, you know, sex ed hard to come by, and you think about the fact that traditionally women would go to their family to ask for basic health information. The person they're asking is their mother-in-law and their sister-in-law, usually, right off the bat, right? And you can see how that lens, the information they're getting may or may not be objective, right? And, um, and so, so, but that is starting to change. But the second layer is you'd say, well, well, great, so then they can just go to, you know, they can just go to a gynecologist and ask a basic question. But this is where taboo again starts to operate because, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story. Single adult woman goes to a gynecologist and says, hi doctor, I'd like a prescription for the pill. And the doctor says, but you're not married. That's the response, that's the standard response. And in fact, in, in gynecological care in India, you know, uh, <laughs> marital status is actually used as a stand-in for sexual activity, right? And we, we actually did, we ran a survey of our readers um, and we got 1,100 women to, to, to respond to questions about their experiences with their gynecologists. 50% responded that they don't feel comfortable openly discussing sex with their gynecologist. So you can see how the taboo and the shame is operating, even in the context of what should be a very open conversation. Um, but, again, good news, this is really, really starting to change. Young women are not having it. They are questioning it, they are pushing back. I can't tell you how many lists I've seen, crowdsourced lists of gynecologists, where there are columns. Is this doctor queer friendly? Uh, is this doctor open to prescribing contraceptives to unmarried women, right? And so they're going through all of these lists and hundreds, thousands of women are coming together and actually making these lists of who, you know, who are the doctors who are more open-minded and progressive. Um, so, you know, people are taking matters into their own hands and young women are definitely pushing back against these taboos. One topic that I did want to touch on with both of you, which um, we haven't really discussed just yet is sexual violence, mm -hmm. abuse, and rape. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when I was trying to convince Carla to jump on a plane from Bombay, you know, I said, I think there's this impression that has been projected in the Western media of a, you know, the stories that tend to make the Western media are about rape. And the truth is, and I think we can all agree on this, that this is a still a sexual violence, sexual abuse in India is still a huge problem. Sonam, I want to talk to you about it first. Um, in Bollywood, you know, in the last couple of months, mm 
Um, there have been a few uh, actresses that have come forward, and for those of you who haven't followed along, the same kind of Me Too movement that has enveloped, you know, you know, politics and government and you know, technology and uh, media in in the West is also now happening in India, and particularly. Um, poignantly in Bollywood. Mm -hmm. Can you, you know, what is your reaction to this Me Too? I mean, a lot of the very high profile people in, in Bollywood haven't said anything. Nobody said anything. Yeah, there were some <laughs> lower profile actresses yeah. who, who came, came forward with stories. Why is that? Why aren't people, why aren't the high profile people talk? Because it's clearly a problem, right? Everyone yeah. knows it's a problem. So I wrote this article on it and I obviously spoke up about it, but um, it's uh, like, Carla said there's a lot of shaming and there's a lot of victim blaming and shaming in India and especially if you're on a platform like I have I'm very lucky to have a lot of family and friends who are very supportive of me saying a lot of things that make sense and a lot of things that don't make sense but uh, they, they support me a lot and say, okay, Sonam, it's okay, you have this voice, it's okay for you to speak it and I, and I, have, I have something to, you know, I have a safety net. A lot of these girls and boys don't have that and um, so, I, I mean, I don't blame anybody for not speaking up, but it's a shame that they don't because it's so prevalent in the film industry, in every industry in India, because unfortunately, it is a patriarchal society and it is, women are treated like garbage. There's, it's so weird, it's so contrary. Some of the most powerful people in our country are women. We pray to goddesses. We, every festival, where there's a Durga, it's, where there's Durga Puja, where there's Lakshmi Puja, which is in Diwali, uh, Sajaswati, they're all goddesses, but we still treat women like they are, we objectify them, we don't treat them well. Um, and uh, that's basically what it is. And so women are scared to talk about it. And it's so, so sad because you do have a platform and sometimes it's okay to take the leap because, you know, it's, it's fine to do it. And hopefully with one person speaking or with like two other people speaking i, I guess it was just farhan and me yeah. who spoke about it um in the farhan akhtar farhan akhtar yeah and um i don't think anybody else uh, uh, priyanka i think retweeted a tweet or something but nobody's actually been out there and spoken about it and taken a stand because everybody's like oh you know uh, i don't want to like two of my closest friends who are very very good friends have actually experienced horrible sexual encounters and, uh, you know, being harassed very badly, don't want to talk about it, and I completely am okay with it. Uh, but they don't because they, you know, one of my friends was like, I don't want to be known as a victim for the rest of my life, yeah. especially in the film industry. She was like, you know, my, I want to be desirable, and my whole career is built on that. I, you know, take care of, like, my seven, you know, my siblings and my family, et cetera, et cetera. I do not want that to be what defines me. Right. So, and... The I thing mean, is with the, the shame, the shame that exists, you know, in, in Bollywood, yeah. um, it exists everywhere yeah. in India. And this, this culture of abuse, it is not something that is limited or... It, you know, changes that social by the, social class. The, it happens everywhere. everywhere. And the thing is, like, I've had some of the most educated and the most, I don't know how to explain it, the most traveled and aware people tell, make jokes on it, like Me Too jokes, you know? And I'm just like, it's not funny. Why are you laughing about it? Yeah. And they, she, they, like, you don't have a sense of humor. I said, no, not where this is concerned. I don't. This mm. is not funny. We can't take this lightly, yeah. you know? Um, and that's what it is. It's just the way we've been brought up, the way we've been, uh, the way we think. It's not, it's, it's, it has to be a complete rehaul of the way we think. Mm -hmm. And that, unfortunately, cannot be something that is slow. It has to be like, it has to be something that's a shove. It has to be something that's a push. It can't be slow and steady. It, it, it's, it's very scary, actually, uh, because for all the progress that India is going through, there are things that, like, I did this film called Padman, uh, which was about, um, know, yeah, you know, <laughs> so Padman is about this guy who makes sanitary napkins that are cheaper, and I was part of this film, and it's, it was led by a commercial, very big commercial star called Akshay Kumar, and we were shooting in this small village, and we had these junior actors from the village and they were supposed to hold sanitary napkins in their hand and they refused to do it. They just like left. 
they were like, we are not going to do it. And I was sitting and doing like interviews with like very educated journalists and they were they were they were just shy to ask me questions because of the t it's the social it's taboo. taboo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we yeah. you know women are supposed to be seen, not heard. Right. You know, um, that's one of the first things that is being told to us. You yeah. know, um, if you behave like that, who is going to marry you? Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, if you you know don't you know don't you know I mean I remember I I'm very tall. And so if I wear heels, like if uh, somebody told me, don't wear so many heels, I was like, why not? <laughs> like, it make a man, I was like, I don't care what it makes the other person feel. Mm -hmm. I want to feel good about myself. <laughs> yeah. So these are the things that, <laughs> these are the things, you know, it's just, it's, we've been conformed to think that way. Yeah. But the one thing, I'm so grateful for my parents, especially my dad, who always taught, taught me that, you know, there's, there is no difference between you and your brother. There is no difference. And if you want to be successful, it was never about you have to get married. It was always about you have to make a difference in life. You have to go down in posterity. You have, that was the way I was brought up. That was the way I was taught. And thank God for that. Right. And, you know, because otherwise... So is that where the change has to start then, Carla, in the family? Does it have to start by mothers and fathers saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, you're the same. I mean, definitely, definitely. So I think breaking down some of these uh, gender stereotypes, it absolutely starts at home. Um, there, there's been a, a lot of movement, again, on, on breaking gender stereotypes. I mean, this, this plays out a lot in the context of um, women in the workplace. Shiv mentioned uh, female labor force participation. And um, female labor force participation rates in India have actually been dropping. Um, and he said 17%, but there are, there are some other figures out there that say it's you know, 10, 11, so it doesn't matter. But still, but still, 17%. Exactly, whether it's 10, whether it's 17, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's terrible. And what's actually amazing when you think about the landscape of India is almost 50% of graduates from colleges and graduate schools are women. And when, when people enter the workforce, almost 50% of the entrance to the workforce is women. And yet, by the time you reach the absolute highest levels of corporate India, you're talking 2%, 5%. And so something's happening in there. Um, and really what's happening is a lot of social conditioning and a lot of family pressure that's pulling women back into the home. Um, and I think, um, I think that is, is certainly, certainly very dangerous and it, and it puts women sort of in the middle. Um, and it really frames their roles as wife and mother as more significant or more important than their roles outside the home. So that certainly can change um, okay. inside the home. Well, um, sadly, I think I could talk about this for a while. <laughs> I, have a, I have a personal strong interest in India, but we've run out of time. I want to thank Sonam and Carla both for their personal thoughts. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.